Chapter Ten. Eugène was roused from his musings by the voice of the stout Sylvie, who announced that the tailor had come, and Eugène therefore made his appearance before the man with the two money bags, and was not ill pleased that it should be so. When he had tried on his dress suit, he put on his new morning costume, which completely metamorphosed him. I am quite equal to Monsieur de Troyes, he said to himself. In short, I look like a gentleman. You asked me, sir, if I knew the houses where Madame de Nucingen goes, Father Goriot's voice spoke from the doorway of Eugène's room. Yes. Very well, then. She is going to the Maréchal Carigliano's ball on Monday. If you can manage to be there, I shall hear from you whether my two girls enjoyed themselves, and how they were dressed, and all about it, in fact. How did you find that out, my good Gorio? said Eugène, putting a chair by the fire for his visitor. Her maid told me. I hear all about their doings from Thérèse and Constance, he added gleefully. The old man looked like a lover who is still young enough to be made happy by the discovery of some little stratagem which brings him information of his lady-love without her knowledge. "'You will see them both,' he said, giving artless expression to a pang of jealousy. "'I do not know,' answered Eugène. "'I will go to Madame de Beauséant and ask her for an introduction to the Maréchal.' Eugène felt a thrill of pleasure at the thought of appearing before the Vicomtesse, dressed as henceforward he always meant to be. The abysses of the human heart, in the moralist's phrase, are only insidious thoughts, involuntary promptings of personal interest. The instinct of enjoyment turns the scale. Those rapid changes of purpose which have furnished the text for so much rhetoric are calculations prompted by the hope of pleasure. Rastignac, beholding himself well-dressed and impeccable as to gloves and boots, forgot his virtuous resolutions. Youth, moreover, when bent upon wrongdoing, does not dare to behold himself in the mirror of consciousness. Mature age has seen itself, and therein lies the whole difference between these two phases of life. A friendship between Eugène and his neighbor, Father Goriot, had been growing up for several days past. This secret friendship, and the antipathy that the student had begun to entertain for Vautrin, arose from the same psychological causes. The bold philosopher who shall investigate the effects of mental action upon the physical world will doubtless find more than one proof of the material nature of our sentiments in other animals. What physiognomist is as quick to discern character as a dog is to discover from a stranger's face whether this is a friend or no? Those bywords, atoms, affinities, are facts surviving in modern languages for the confusion of philosophic wiseacres who amuse themselves by winnowing the chaff of language to find its grammatical roots. We feel that we are loved. Our sentiments make themselves felt in everything, even at a great distance. A letter is the living soul, and so faithful an echo of the voice that speaks in it, that finer natures look upon a letter as one of love's most precious treasures. Father Goriot's affection was of the instinctive order, a canine affection raised to a sublime pitch. He had scented compassion in the air and the kindly respect and youthful sympathy in the student's heart. This friendship had, however, scarcely reached the stage at which confidences are made. Though Eugène had spoken of his wish to meet Madame de Nucingen, it was not because he counted on the old man to introduce him to her house, for he hoped that his own audacity might stand him in good stead. All that Father Goriot had said as yet about his daughters had referred to the remarks that the student had made so freely in public on that day of the two visits. "'How could you think that Madame de Restaud bore you a grudge for mentioning my name?' he had said on the day following that scene at dinner. "'My daughters are very fond of me.' 
i am a happy father but my sons-in-law have behaved badly to me and rather than make trouble between my darlings and their husbands i choose to see my daughters secretly fathers who can see their daughters at any time have no idea of all the pleasure that all this mystery gives me i cannot always see mine when i wish do you understand so when it is fine i walk out in the champs elysees after finding out from their waiting-maids whether my daughters mean to go out i wait near the entrance my heart beats fast when the carriages begin to come i admire them in their dresses and as they pass they give me a little smile and it seems as if everything was lighted up for me by a ray of bright sunlight i wait for they always go back the same way and then i see them again the fresh air has done them good and brought color into their cheeks all about me people say what a beautiful woman that is and it does my heart good to hear them are they not my own flesh and blood i love the very horses that draw them i envy the little lap-dog on their knees their happiness is my life every one loves after his own fashion and mine does no one any harm why should people trouble their heads about me i am happy in my own way is there any law against going to see my girls in the evening when they are going out to a ball and what a disappointment it is when i get there too late and am told that madame has gone out once i waited till three o'clock in the morning for nasie i had not seen her for two whole days i was so pleased that it was almost too much for me please do not speak of me unless it is to say how good my daughters are to me they are always wanting to heap presents upon me but i will not have it just keep your money i tell them what should i do with it i want nothing and what am i sir after all an old carcass whose soul is always where my daughters are when you have seen madame de nucingen tell me which you like the most said the old man after a moment's pause while eugene put the last touches to his toilette the student was about to go out to walk in the garden of the tuileries until the hour when he could venture to appear in madame de beauseant's drawing-room that walk was a turning point in eugene's career several women noticed him he looked so handsome so young and so well dressed this almost admiring attention gave a new turn to his thoughts he forgot his sisters and the aunt who had robbed herself for him he no longer remembered his own virtuous scruples he had seen hovering above his head the fiend so easy to mistake for an angel the devil with rainbow wings who scatters rubies and aims his golden shafts at palace fronts who invests women with purple and thrones with a glory that dazzles the eyes of fools till they forget the simple origins of royal dominion he had heard the rustle of that vanity whose tinsel seems to us to be the symbol of power however cynical vautrin's words had been they had made an impression on his mind as the sordid features of the old crone who whispers a lover and gold in torrents remain engraven on a young girl's memory eugene lounged about the walks till it was nearly five o'clock then he went to madame de beauseant and received one of the terrible blows against which young hearts are defenceless hitherto the vicomtesse had received him with the kindly urbanity the bland grace of manner that is the result of fine breeding but is only complete when it comes from the heart to-day madame de beauseant bowed constrainedly and spoke curtly monsieur de rastignac i cannot possibly see you at least not at this moment i am engaged an observer and rastignac instantly became an observer could read the whole history the character and customs of caste in the phrase in the tones of her voice in her glance and bearing he caught a glimpse of the iron hand beneath the velvet glove the personality the egoism beneath the manner the wood beneath the varnish 
in short he heard that unmistakable i the king that issues from the plumed canopy of the throne and finds its last echo under the crest of the simplest gentleman eugene had trusted too implicitly to the generosity of a woman he could not believe in her haughtiness like all the unfortunate he had subscribed in all good faith the generous compact which should bind the benefactor to the recipient and the first article in that bond between two large-hearted natures is a perfect equality the kindness which knits two souls together is as rare as divine and as little understood as the passion of love for both love and kindness are the lavish generosity of noble natures rastignac was set upon going to the duchesse de carolliano's ball so he swallowed down this rebuff madame he faltered out i would not have come to trouble you about a trifling matter be so kind as to permit me to see you later i can wait very well come and dine with me she said a little confused by the harsh way in which she had spoken for this lady was as genuinely kind-hearted as she was high-born eugene was touched by this sudden relenting but none the less he said to himself as he went away crawl in the dust put up with every kind of treatment what must the rest of the world be like when one of the kindest of women forgets all her promises of befriending me in a moment and tosses me aside like an old shoe so it is every one for himself it is true that her house is not a shop and i have put myself in the wrong by needing her help you should cut your way through the world like a cannon-ball as vautrin said but the student's bitter thoughts were soon dissipated by the pleasure which he promised himself in this dinner with the vicomtesse fate seemed to determine that the smallest accidents in his life should combine to urge him into a career which the terrible sphinx of the maison vauquer had described as a field of battle where you must either slay or be slain and cheat to avoid being cheated you leave your conscience and your heart at the barriers and wear a mask on entering into this game of grim earnest where as in ancient sparta you must snatch your prize without being detected if you would deserve the crown on his return he found the vicomtesse gracious and kindly as she had always been to him they went together to the dining-room where the vicomte was waiting for his wife in the time of the restoration the luxury of the table was carried as is well known to the highest degree and m de beauseant like many jaded men of the world had few pleasures left but those of good cheer in this matter in fact he was a gourmand of the schools of louis the eighteenth and of the duc d'escar and luxury was supplemented by splendor eugene dining for the first time in a house where the traditions of grandeur had descended through many generations had never seen any spectacle like this that now met his eyes in the time of the empire balls had always ended with a supper because the officers who took part in them must be fortified for immediate service and even in paris might be called upon to leave the ballroom for the battlefield this arrangement had gone out of fashion under the monarchy and eugene had so far only been asked to dances the self-possession which preeminently distinguished him in later life already stood him in good stead and he did not betray his amazement yet as he saw for the first time the finely wrought silver plate the completeness of every detail the sumptuous dinner noiselessly served it was difficult for such an ardent imagination not to prefer this life of studied and refined luxury to the hardships of the life which he had chosen only that morning his thoughts went back for a moment to the lodging-house and with a feeling of profound loathing he vowed to himself that at new year he would go 
prompted at least as much by a desire to live among cleaner surroundings as by a wish to shake off vautrin whose huge hand he seemed to feel on his shoulder at that moment when you consider the numberless forms clamorous or mute that corruption takes in paris common sense begins to wonder what mental aberration prompted the state to establish great colleges and schools there and assemble young men in the capital how is it that pretty women are respected or that the gold coin displayed in the money changers wooden saucers does not take to itself wings in the twinkling of an eye and when you come to think further how comparatively few cases of crime there are and to count up the misdemeanors committed by youth is there not a certain amount of respect due to these patient tantaluses who wrestle with themselves and nearly always come off victorious the struggles of the poor student in paris if skilfully drawn would furnish a most dramatic picture of modern civilization in vain madame de beauseant looked at eugene as if asking him to speak the student was tongue-tied in the vicomte's presence are you going to take me to the italien this evening the vicomtesse asked her husband you cannot doubt that i should obey you with pleasure he answered and there was a sarcastic tinge in his politeness which eugene did not detect but i ought to go to meet some one at the varieté his mistress said she to herself then is not ajuda coming for you this evening inquired the vicomte no she answered petulantly very well then if you really must have an arm take that of monsieur de rastignac the vicomtesse turned to eugene with a smile that would be a very compromising step for you she said a frenchman loves danger because in danger there is glory to quote monsieur de chateaubriand said rastignac with a bow a few moments later he was sitting beside madame de beauseant in a brougham that whirled them through the streets of paris to a fashionable theatre it seemed to him that some fairy magic had suddenly transported him into a box facing the stage all the lorgnettes of the house were pointed at him as he entered and at the vicomtesse in her charming toilette he went from enchantment to enchantment you must talk to me you know said madame de beauseant ah look there is madame de nucingen in the third box from ours her sister and monsieur de troyes are on the other side the vicomtesse glanced as she spoke at the box where mademoiselle de rochefide should have been monsieur d'ajuda was not there and madame de beauseant's face lighted up in a marvellous way she is charming said eugene after looking at madame de nucingen she has white eyelashes yes but she has such a pretty slender figure her hands are large such beautiful eyes her face is long yes but length gives distinction it is lucky for her that she has some distinction in her face just see how she fidgets with her opera glass the gorio blood shows itself in every movement said the vicomtesse much to eugene's astonishment indeed madame de beauseant seemed to be engaged in making a survey of the house and to be unconscious of madame nucingen's existence but no movement made by the latter was lost upon the vicomtesse the house was full of the loveliest women in paris so that delphine de nucingen was not a little flattered to receive the undivided attention of madame de beauseant's young handsome and well-dressed cousin who seemed to have no eyes for any one else if you look at her so persistently you will make people talk monsieur de rastignac you will never succeed if you fling yourself at any one's head like that my dear cousin said eugene you have protected me indeed so far and now if you would complete your work i only ask of you a favor which will cost you but little and be a very great service to me i have lost my heart already yes 
and to that woman how could i aspire to find any one else to listen to me he asked with a keen glance at his cousin her grace the duchesse de carigliano is a friend of the duchesse de berry he went on after a pause you are sure to see her will you be so kind as to present me to her and to take me to her ball on monday i shall meet madame de nucingen there and enter into my first skirmish willingly she said if you have a liking for her already your affairs of the heart are like to prosper that is de marsay over there in the princesse galatiron's box madame de nucingen is racked with jealousy there is no better time for approaching a woman especially if she happens to be a banker's wife all those ladies of the chaussee d'antin love revenge then what would you do yourself in such a case i should suffer in silence at this point the marquis d'ajuda appeared in madame de beauseant's box i have made a muddle of my affairs to come to you he said and i am telling you about it so that it may not be a sacrifice eugene saw the glow of joy on the vicomtesse's face and knew that this was love and learned the difference between love and the affectations of parisian coquetry he admired his cousin grew mute and yielded his place to monsieur d'ajuda with a sigh how noble how sublime a woman is when she loves like that he said to himself and he could forsake her for a doll oh how could any one forsake her there was a boy's passionate indignation in his heart he could have flung himself at madame de beauseant's feet he longed for the power of the devil if he could snatch her away and hide her in his heart as an eagle snatches up some white yearling from the plains and bears it to its eyrie it was humiliating to him to think that in all this gallery of fair pictures he had not one picture of his own to have a mistress and an almost royal position is a sign of power he said to himself and he looked at madame de nucingen as a man measures another who has insulted him the vicomtesse turned to him and the expression of her eyes thanked him a thousand times for his discretion the first act came to an end just then do you know madame de nucingen well enough to present monsieur de rastignac to her she asked of the marquis d'ajuda she will be delighted said the marquis the handsome portuguese rose as he spoke and took the student's arm and in another moment eugene found himself in madame de nucingen's box madame said the marquis i have the honour of presenting to you the chevalier eugene de rastignac he is a cousin of madame de beauseant's you have made so deep an impression upon him that i thought i would fill up the measure of his happiness by bringing him nearer to his divinity words spoken half jestingly to cover their somewhat disrespectful import but such an implication if carefully disguised never gives offence to a woman madame de nucingen smiled and offered eugene the place which her husband had just left i do not venture to suggest that you should stay with me monsieur she said those who are so fortunate as to be in madame de beauseant's company do not desire to leave it madame eugene said lowering his voice i think that to please my cousin i should remain with you before my lord marquis came we were speaking of you and of your exceedingly distinguished appearance he added aloud monsieur d'ajuda turned and left them are you really going to stay with me monsieur asked the baroness then we shall make each other's acquaintance madame de restaud told me about you and has made me anxious to meet you she must be very insincere then for she has shut her door on me what madame i will tell you honestly the reason why but i must crave your indulgence before confiding such a secret to you i am your father's neighbor i had no idea that madame de restaud was his daughter i was rash enough to mention his name i meant no harm but i annoyed your sister and her husband very much 
you cannot think how severely the duchesse de langeais and my cousin blamed this apostasy on a daughter's part as a piece of bad taste i told them all about it and they both burst out laughing then madame de beauseant made some comparison between you and your sister speaking in high terms of you and saying how very fond you were of my neighbor m goriot and indeed how could you help loving him he adores you so passionately that i am jealous already we talked about you this morning for two hours so this evening i was quite full of all that your father had told me and while i was dining with my cousin i said that you could not be as beautiful as affectionate madame de beauseant meant to gratify such warm admiration i think when she brought me here telling me in her gracious way that i should see you then even now i owe you a debt of gratitude monsieur said the banker's wife we shall be quite old friends in a little while although a friendship with you could not be like an ordinary friendship said rastignac i should never wish to be your friend such stereotyped phrases as these in the mouths of beginners possess an unfailing charm for women and are insipid only when read coldly for a young man's tone glance and attitude give a surpassing eloquence to the banal phrases madame de nucingen thought that rastignac was adorable then womanlike being at a loss how to reply to the student's outspoken admiration she answered a previous remark yes it is very wrong of my sister to treat our poor father as she does she said he has been a providence to us it was not until monsieur de nucingen positively ordered me only to receive him in the mornings that i yielded the point but i have been unhappy about it for a long while i have shed many tears over it this violence to my feelings with my husband's brutal treatment have been two causes of my unhappy married life there is certainly no woman in paris whose lot seems more enviable than mine and yet in reality there is not one so much to be pitied you will think i must be out of my senses to talk to you like this but you know my father and i cannot regard you as a stranger you will find no one said eugene who longs as eagerly as i do to be yours what do all women seek happiness he answered his own question in low vibrating tones and if happiness for a woman means that she is to be loved and adored to have a friend to whom she can pour out her wishes her fancies her sorrows and joys to whom she can lay bare her heart and soul and all her fair defects and her gracious virtues without fear of a betrayal believe me the devotion and the warmth that never fails can only be found in the heart of a young man who at a bare sign from you would go to his death who neither knows nor cares to know anything as yet of the world because you will be all the world to him i myself you see you will laugh at my simplicity have just come from a remote country district i am quite new to this world of paris i have only known true and loving hearts and i made up my mind that here i should find no love then i chanced to meet my cousin and to see my cousin's heart from very near i have divined the inexhaustible treasures of passion and like cherubino i am the lover of all women until the day comes when i find the woman to whom i may devote myself as soon as i saw you as soon as i came into the theatre this evening i felt myself borne towards you as if by the current of a stream i had so often thought of you already but i had never dreamed that you would be so beautiful madame de beauseant told me that i must not look so much at you she does not know the charm of your red lips your fair face nor see how soft your eyes are i also am beginning to talk nonsense but let me talk nothing pleases a woman better than to listen to such whispered words as these the most puritanical among them listens even when she ought not to reply to them and rastignac having once begun continued to pour out his story dropping his voice that she might lean and listen 
and Madame de Nucingen, smiling, glanced from time to time at de Marsay, who still sat in the Princesse Galatian's box. Rastignac did not leave Madame de Nucingen till her husband came to take her home. Madame, Eugène said, I shall have the pleasure of calling upon you before the Duchesse de Caroliano's ball. If Madame invites you to come, said the Baron, a thick-set Alsatian with indications of a sinister cunning in his full moon countenance, you are quite sure of being well received. My affairs seem to be in a promising way, said Eugène to himself. Can you love me? I asked her, and she did not resent it. The bit is in the horse's mouth, and I have only to mount and ride. And with that he went to pay his respects to Madame de Beauséant, who was leaving the theatre on D'Ajuda's arm. The student did not know that the Baroness's thoughts had been wandering, that she was even then expecting a letter from de Marsay, one of those letters that bring about a rupture that rends the soul. So, happy in his delusion, Eugène went with the Vicomtesse to the peristyle, where people were waiting till their carriages were announced. "'That cousin of yours is hardly recognizable for the same man,' said the Portuguese laughingly to the Vicomtesse, when Eugène had taken leave of them. "'He will break the bank. He is as supple as an eel. He will go a long way, of that I am sure. Who else could have picked out a woman for him, as you did?' just when she needed consolation. "'But it is not certain that she does not still love the faithless lover,' said Madame de Beauséant. The student, meanwhile, walked back from the Théâtre Italien to the Rue Neuve Sainte Geneviève, making the most delightful plans as he went. He had noticed how closely Madame de Rostaud had scrutinized him when he sat beside Madame de Nucingen and inferred that the countess's doors would not be closed in the future. Four important houses were now open to him, for he meant to stand well with the Marichal. He had four supporters in the inmost circle of society in Paris. Even now it was clear to him that, once involved in this intricate social machinery, he must attach himself to a spoke of the wheel that was to turn and raise his fortunes, he would not examine himself too curiously as to the methods, but he was certain of the end, and conscious of the power to gain and keep his hold. If Madame de Nucingen takes an interest in me, I will teach her how to manage her husband. That husband of hers is a great speculator. He might put me in the way of making a fortune by a single stroke. He did not say this bluntly in so many words. As yet, indeed, he was not sufficient of a diplomatist to sum up a situation, to see its possibilities at a glance, and calculate the chances in his favour. These were nothing but hazy ideas that floated over his mental horizon. They were less cynical than Vautrin's notions, but if they had been tried in the crucible of conscience, no very pure result would have issued from the test. It is by a succession of such like transactions that men sink at last to the level of the relaxed morality of this epoch, when there have never been so few of those who square their courses with their theories, so few of those noble characters who do not yield to temptation, for whom the slightest deviation from the line of rectitude is a crime. To these magnificent types of uncompromising right we owe two masterpieces, the Alceste of Molière, and in our own day the characters of Jeanie Deans and her father in Sir Walter Scott's novel. Perhaps a work which should chronicle the opposite course, which should trace out all the devious courses through which a man of the world, a man of ambitions, drags his conscience, just steering clear of crime, that he may gain his end and yet save appearances, such a chronicle would be no less edifying and no less dramatic. Rastignac went home. He was fascinated by Madame de Nucingen. He seemed to see her before him, slender and graceful as a swallow. He recalled the intoxicating sweetness of her eyes, her fair hair, the delicate silken tissue of the skin, 
beneath which it almost seemed to him that he could see the blood coursing the tones of her voice still exerted a spell over him he had forgotten nothing his walk perhaps heated his imagination by sending a glow of warmth through his veins he knocked unceremoniously at goriot's door i have seen madame delphine neighbor said he where at the italien did she enjoy it just come inside and the old man left his bed unlocked the door and promptly returned again it was the first time that eugene had been in father goriot's room and he could not control his feeling of amazement at the contrast between the den in which the father lived and the costume of the daughter whom he had just beheld the window was curtainless the walls were damp in places the varnished wallpaper had come away and gave glimpses of the grimy yellow plaster beneath the wretched bed on which the old man lay boasted but one thin blanket and a wadded quilt made out of large pieces of madame vauquer's old dresses the floor was damp and gritty opposite the window stood a chest of drawers made of rosewood one of the old-fashioned kind with a curving front and brass handles shaped like rings of twisted vine stems covered with flowers and leaves on a venerable piece of furniture with a wooden shelf stood a ewer and basin and shaving apparatus a pair of shoes stood in one corner a night table by the bed had neither a door nor marble slab there was not a trace of a fire in the empty grate the square walnut table with the crossbar against which father goriot had crushed and twisted his posset dish stood near the hearth the old man's hat was lying on a broken-down bureau an armchair stuffed with straw and a couple of chairs completed the list of ramshackle furniture from the tester of the bed tied to the ceiling by a piece of rag hung a strip of some cheap material in large red and black checks no poor drudge in a garret could be worse lodged than father goriot in madame vauquer's lodging-house the mere sight of the room sent a chill through you and a sense of oppression it was like the worst cell in a prison luckily goriot could not see the effect that his surroundings produced on eugene as the latter deposited his candle on the night-table the old man turned round keeping the bedclothes huddled up to his chin well he said and which do you like the best madame de restaud or madame de nucingen i like madame delphine the best said the law student because she loves you the best at the words so heartily spoken the old man's hand slipped out from under the bedclothes and grasped eugene's thank you thank you he said gratefully then what did she say about me the student repeated the baroness's remarks with some embellishments of his own the old man listening the while as though he heard a voice from heaven dear child he said yes yes she is very fond of me but you must not believe all that she tells you about anastasie the two sisters are jealous of each other you see another proof of their affection madame de restaud is very fond of me too i know she is a father sees his children as god sees all of us he looks into the very depths of their hearts he knows their intentions and both of them are so loving oh if i only had good sons-in-law i should be too happy and i dare say there is no perfect happiness here below if i might live with them simply hear their voices know that they are there see them go and come as i used to do at home when they were still with me why my heart bounds at the thought were they nicely dressed yes said eugene but monsieur goriot how is it that your daughters have such fine houses while you live in such a den as this dear me why should i want anything better he replied with seeming carelessness i can't quite explain to you how it is i am not used to stringing words together properly but it all lies there he said tapping his heart 
my real life is in my two girls you see and so long as they are happy and smartly dressed and have soft carpets under their feet what does it matter what clothes i wear or where i lie down of a night i shall never feel cold so long as they are warm i shall never feel dull if they are laughing i have no troubles but theirs when you too are a father and you hear your children's little voices you will say to yourself that has all come from me you will feel that those little ones are akin to every drop in your veins that they are the very flower of your life and what else are they you will cleave so closely to them that you seem to feel every movement that they make everywhere i hear their voices sounding in my ears if they are sad the look in their eyes freezes my blood some day you will find out that there is far more happiness in another's happiness than in your own it is something that i cannot explain something within that sends a glow of warmth all through you in short i live my life three times over shall i tell you something funny well then since i have been a father i have come to understand god he is everywhere in the world because the whole world comes from him and it is just the same with my children monsieur only i love my daughters better than god loves the world for the world is not so beautiful as god himself is but my children are more beautiful than i am their lives are so bound up with mine that i felt somehow that you would see them this evening great heaven if any man would make my little delphine as happy as a wife is when she is loved i would black his boots and run on his errands that miserable monsieur de marsay is a cur i know all about him from her maid a longing to wring his neck comes over me now and then he does not love her does not love a pearl of a woman with a voice like a nightingale and shaped like a model where can her eyes have been when she married that great lump of an alsatian they ought both of them to have married young men good-looking and good-tempered but after all they had their own way father goriot was sublime eugene had never yet seen his face light up as it did now with the passionate fervor of a father's love it is worthy of remark that strong feeling has a very subtle and pervasive power the roughest nature in the endeavor to express a deep and sincere affection communicates to others the influence that has put resonance into the voice and eloquence into every gesture wrought a change in the very features of the speaker for under the inspiration of passion the stupidest human being attains to the highest eloquence of ideas if not of language and seems to move in some sphere of light in the old man's tones and gestures there was something just then of the same spell that a great actor exerts over his audience but does not the poet in us find expression in our affections well said eugene perhaps you will not be sorry to hear that she is pretty sure to break with de marsay before long that sprig of fashion has left her for the princess galatione for my part i fell in love with madame delphine this evening stuff said father goriot i did indeed and she did not regard me with aversion for a whole hour we talked of love and i am to go to call on her on saturday the day after to-morrow oh how i should love you if she should like you you are kind-hearted you would never make her miserable if you were to forsake her i would cut your throat at once a woman does not love twice you see good heavens what nonsense i am talking monsieur eugene it is cold you ought not to stay here mon dieu so you have heard her speak what message did she give you for me none at all said eugene to himself aloud he answered she told me to tell you that your daughter sends you a good kiss good night neighbor sleep well and pleasant dreams to you 
i have mine already made for me by that message from her may god grant you all your desires you have come in like a good angel on me to-night and brought with you the air that my daughter breathes poor old fellow said eugene as he lay down it is enough to melt a heart of stone his daughter no more thought of him than of the grand turk ever after this conference Gorio looked upon his neighbor as a friend a confidant such as he had never hoped to find and there was established between the two the only relationship that could attach this old man to another man the passions never miscalculate father Gorio felt that this friendship brought him closer to his daughter delphine he thought that he should find a warmer welcome for himself if the baroness should care for eugene moreover he had confided one of his troubles to the younger man madame de nucingen for whose happiness he prayed a thousand times daily had never known the joys of love eugene was certainly to make use of his own expression one of the nicest young men that he had ever seen and some prophetic instinct seemed to tell him that eugene was to give her the happiness which had not been hers these were the beginnings of a friendship that grew up between the old man and his neighbor but for this friendship the catastrophe of the drama must have remained a mystery End of chapter ten